Good morning, everybody. Happy International Women's Day to all the amazing women out there and to all our male colleagues who are also part of this. This is the first time we are holding International Women's Day celebrations as part of the global movement at East Lancashire Hospitals. We have a newly founded women's network from last year, which has made this possible. And right at the onset, I would like to thank our wonderful communications team and Eleanor Davis, who is at the back of the stage doing the production side, making this live webinar possible for us. And thank you all for joining us. Next slide, please, Sir Eleanor. We may have some initial problems with the techie side. This is the first webinar live we are doing. So for those of you who may not know me, I'm Dr. Krishna Murthy, a consultant gynecologist and an associate medical director here. I, I'm very privileged and honored to be in the position of the founding chair of the Women's Network, entrusted with this rewarding level of responsibility on behalf of the Trust Women's Network. So, and thank you to the amazing women that I get the opportunity to work with. I also have a role with the NHS England as one of the deputy medical directors for professional standards and systems improvement. And I'm one of the co-chairs for the BAME network, recently started helping out with the disability network and passionate about inclusion in general, because I truly believe an inclusive culture is what is the overarching culture beyond anything else that will enable all of us, humanity, to function at the peak performance that we can deliver. Next slide, Eleanor. So, empowered women, empower women. That is our tagline, guys. And we are, we have a fantastic cohort of women at East Lancashire. Of the 9,740 plus staff, 80% are women, 7,700 something women. How amazing is that? So, predominantly a female workforce, and we are working magic here, and we can do more wonders collectively once we feel empowered. Next slide, please, Eleanor. So for today, because we are celebrating International Women's Day, let us pause for a moment and think of the team, theme for this year. Every year there is a theme. So this year's theme is break the bias. You would have seen some of the pictures that are floating in social media as well. Break the bias is a very profound theme because whether we acknowledge it or not, conscious or intentional, bias exists all around us. It is not enough that we recognize it. It is not enough that we talk about it. We need to know how to break that bias. I have a personal belief that regardless of the biases, that if you focus mindfully and consciously on conscious mindful inclusion, your focus is on the positive inclusion side. So the unconscious biases or the conscious biases become irrelevant. So the easiest and the most effective way to break the bias is through conscious mindful inclusion. We look at it in a moment. So for a moment, imagine a gender equal world, a world that is free of bias, free of stereotypes, free of discrimination, discrimination that is diverse, that celebrates the uniqueness of every individual, where difference is valued and celebrated. And we know how to harness that richness. We're all curious to know about each other and the different perspectives we hold, bring different thinking to the table. That leads on to innovation, that leads on to collaboration, safety culture, the synergy between the teams, everything evolves from that simple act of inclusion, which is why inclusion is what is going to pave the way for our organizational performance as a peak performer. Next slide, please. So for this International Women's Day, there are four key strands. One is about uplifting women. We take it for granted and the literature shows that women are not recognized as well as they could be. Second is about collaboration. Third is call for action. And the fourth is philanthropy, enhancing awareness as well as a fundraising. At this moment, I would like to give a big shout out to Kate Quinn. 
She is the lady who has role modeled the way for inclusion and made the road easier for us. And without her, this transformation within the organization with regards to the inclusive focus would, would not have happened. I wouldn't be here with this level of commitment to inclusion if not for Kate and the influence she had on me. So Kate, big shout out to you and thank you. We should all follow that kind of inclusive focus, being an ally to the BAME network, to the disability network, to the LGBTQ network. We could all follow that role modeling. So this day marks a call to action for accelerating women's equality, and it is a global day celebrating women to celebrate each other pretty much. Elena, you can move on, please. So there are six missions, key missions for this year's International Women's Day. Each one is a strand that we are committed to at East Langs. The first one is what we've been talking about so long, building inclusive workplaces where women can thrive and flourish. But anything, any initiative or energy we focus on women, it benefits everybody, the entire humanity, children, adults, males, elderly, everyone benefits. So building inclusive workplaces is the first commitment. Improving equality for women in all fields. We have to look at enabling gender parity, bridging gender pay gaps, celebrating women who foster innovation, elevate the visibility for women creatives. We need to actively do that. Forge women's empowerment, celebrate the women forging change and empower women's choices and health. We will look at that. And I would like to remind our male colleagues out there regarding the UN Women's Solidarity Movement for Gender Equality, which was a he for she movement. It is still live. If every one of our male colleagues thought I am there for the women out there and has our back, then the synergistic effect is even, even more cumulative. Next slide, please, Ellen. So this is the wonderful panel that we have today. So Michelle Brown will be following me very shortly and uh, all the wonderful ladies, we will hear them introducing themselves. But you can already see even on one screen when all the women come together, how beautiful it looks. But imagine the work that comes after that and all the actions that follow through the different work streams. And that's where the true magic happens. We have just started. It is just the beginning. Diversity is just the richness we bring through the differences that we carry and hold. Equality covered by the Equality Act is just about the access to opportunities. We have to move beyond the equality to equity, which is focusing on the outcomes that are equitable. Unless we focus on the outcomes with tailored resources to meet individual needs, which will be different for somebody with disability, somebody with mental health issues, for elderly, etc., we will not be able to address the health inequities in our system and in the general population and the world at large. So that's another focus. We need to focus on the equitable outcomes that we set out as our objectives, rather than on the equality of opportunity and access and the endpoint. We have to look at the endpoint as equitable outcomes. And the simple act of inclusion, whereby what we do makes another feel empowered, enabled, engaged, give them the permission to participate and contribute, be the authentic version of themselves, bring the best of themselves to the table. That's when they are able to do the best, deliver the best, organization benefits, patients benefit, the team benefits, the service benefits. So the simple act of inclusion from us, from each one of us, has that impact, which is why compassion and inclusion are one and the same. It is attending to another person, enabling that other person, wanting to avoid distress in another person. If we don't do this, distress is the end result. So this inclusion and compassion go hand in hand, which is why a compassionate and inclusive culture is what we work towards. So while we talk about equality and equity, we always need to keep the focus on removing systemic barriers or structural barriers, because that is what will provide so the sustainable long term intergenerational solutions. So we need to 
keep that in mind while we are addressing inequities and planning our work streams. Next slides, Eleanor. So this is a simple tool. Some of you might have heard me mention it previously. Very simple tool, but shifts the mindset from unconscious bias to conscious inclusion. It is called the inclusion scale or the inclusion index. I had to give the ownership to Conferry consultancy firms. They use it, it's globally used. So it helps us to gauge our own reaction to otherness in its simplistic form. It helps us to provide feedback to others that is specific and targeted and evidence-based or inclusive behaviors. It also helps us to hold the mirror to ourselves at some points when we have to recalibrate how we react to otherness. Team feedbacks can be enabled, educational purposes, awareness raising, everything we can use this. So at the bottom end of the scale is where we have the zero tolerance towards, where people have a repulsion towards others and they feel those people, somebody else is abnormal and they don't belong in the workplace. That is something ELHD has a zero tolerance towards. The second is avoidance. Third is tolerance. Tolerance things of respect, but if you have respect for somebody, but you will not include them, that respect becomes meaningless. Therefore, you have to move into the stage of appreciation, which is all truly inclusive, mindful inclusion, where you value the richness of the difference they bring. Yeah. So that shifts from unconscious bias to conscious inclusion, enables psychological safety, whereby people can be their true selves, not having to fit in. How many times have we heard, I can't put my finger on it. There is something quite, uh, she doesn't gel very well. She doesn't quite fit in. There is no more space for that. Ask yourself the question, am I doing everything to let that person be their true self? Am I accepting them as they are? We shouldn't have the expectation that somebody should fit in. We should allow them to freely be themselves and then reap the benefit of that belonging that enables nourishing and thriving, flourishing and thriving, apologies. Next slide, please, Eleanor. So this is what we are committing to firstly. On this International Women's Day 2022, ELHD Women's Network, and I'm sure the rest of the Inclusion Network will also be committed to that. We commit to building inclusive workplaces through actively promoting conscious inclusion, psychological safety, and the sense of belonging for our workmates, for all our colleagues to be their authentic selves and to be the best version of themselves. Every year in the NHS staff survey, we have the top three causes of discrimination by colleagues or patients or managers mentioned as due to ethnicity or gender or age in that order. We need to reverse that, guys. Year in, year out, we are seeing that, not just at ELHD, across the system, across the NHS. We have an opportunity to change that with each one of us embracing this conscious, inclusive behavior. Next slide, please, Eleanor. And the second commitment that I would like to set, set out today is proposed today in front of you is, women are worse affected worst affected after any natural disaster. Although man-made, the COVID-19, the pa global pandemic was also a disaster and we knew the disproportionate impact it had on women. So the United Nations states that women must be actively involved in the climate response actions. Next slide, please, Eleanor. So we need to make sure that we are actively involved in greener environment because there is very strong evidence base to it which is health related. Areas with more accessible green space are associated with better mental health, better physical health, better mortality figures or lower mortality figures, and for the holistic health and well being of people. So imagine if we work on transforming our workspaces in and around the organization and work towards a greener environment. We can think of innovation, we can think of how, the how later. We need to be aligned in the what and the why now so that the vision is set and we work towards that. It could be something as simple as appealing to the hearts of our biggest customer base, our patients, to plant trees. 
we have 7000 plus deliveries every year. Every mother takes home a baby. The vast majority of those who are taking a live baby, I'm saying. But if that landmark event could be marked with planting a tree and we advocate that, actively promote that, encourage that. We make that difference. We have close to 10,000 staff. If we plant one year every year among our staff and as an employer, we promote that. Imagine the tidal wave of impact, positive impact it could have on us, our health, our environment and in the communities at large. So the second commitment we are committing to on this International Women's Day 2022 is our women's network will actively promote a greener environment and work on planting a tree to be encouraged by all our stakeholders. So now I hand over to Michelle. Welcome, Michelle, and I'll go on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Uma. So uh, my name is Michelle Brown. I'm Director of Finance here at the Trust. I just wanted to thank you, Uma, for that fantastic, impassioned introduction to uh, to this session today. Your your passion really does come across and, and for your leadership in this as well. So you have uh, cajoled, you are making sure that this agenda is on everyone's agenda. Um, and I just wanted to say a personal thank you to that to you for that and for the and for the invitation to speak today. Um, so firstly, happy International Women's Day to all of our colleagues out there for the other uh, women who are on this call with me. This is really is an important day and um, as part of the executive team here, um, we are fully supportive of all of the um, issues that are being brought up and it is high on our agenda to address. So I'm going to talk about some of them today. So if we just move on to the next slide, Eleanor, please. OK, so. Um, for the first time, uh, the Department of Health issued a national vision for women's health in uh, December 2021. It's quite sad that it's taken to December 2021 to do that, but it has been published now. And there are seven key themes through that, which are just on the next slide. Eleanor, if you wouldn't mind moving across, or six, sorry. Um, there's six on here, but it says seven. So we just need to work out which one's missing from that. <laughs> So um, the first one is around menstrual health, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Second is fertility, pregnancy and pregnancy loss and postnatal support. Third is menopause. And I know Kate Quinn will pick up around that in her session later on today. Um, fourth is healthy ageing and long term conditions. Fifth is mental health and sixth is the health impacts of violence against women and, and girls. And um, you can see from these specific elements um, concern women in this uh, and that's why it needs that um, that additional focus and as Uma said 80 percent of our for workforce are women and if we are missing some of this stuff we need to address this to support our workforce. So I'm going to start by talking about menstrual health and well-being so periods as we all know are a normal part of everyday life and um, good menstrual health is an essential component to well-being not being able to access sanitary products while at work can negatively impact health and well-being um, and if you notice, looking at this, um, when we start looking at this, just looking around our current facilities, we don't actually provide sanitary machines in our facilities anymore. And that's something that actually, having worked here for 16 years, hadn't really has it hadn't really dawned on me that we weren't doing that. So sometimes it takes a focus of something like this to really just shine a light of like, why don't we do this? And I'm not sure I know the answers to why we don't historically do that, um, but if it, but it's a it's a dignity issue for all of our staff and the BMA in January published a paper um, talking about this specific thing where um, staff certainly in the health service may be working in a different part of the hospital or a different part of site or nowhere near their bags um, and are then conscious that they need to change a pad or whatever and end up a not being able to concentrate on work. It causes stress. It causes worry, especially when you're in uniform, et cetera, other ends of the hospital. And I think we can all relate to that to that happening. So this is it's been a really interesting one to look at because um, uh, and I'm really pleased that the BMA have also picked this up. So in January 2019, NHS England committed to providing free sanitary products to women and girls in hospital. And the local authorities across England started to offer free sanitary products for all their staff and users. And if we move on to the next slide, so for 
to mark International Women's Day this year, ELHT will commit to providing free sanitary products for all women staff in the trust across all sites, thereby ending any potential background, period poverty, poverty or dignity issues that our staff have um, to support health and well-being in the workplace. This actually starts today and I just want to thank our estates and facilities staff who've uh, done an absolutely immense job. So in every department, in every uh, restroom, female toilets in the trust from today, there will be baskets now with period products in for staff to use. Um, they're actually done, they've done a really great um, uh, poster with it as well that comes out with the, the basket that talks about if you want to refill that as well, because we actually know some of our departments already do that and are already providing some of this for their staff. So uh, it's a really great way to support women in, in, the, um, in the workplace. So I'm delighted to announce that we're doing that from, from today for uh, in across all of our areas. And there'll be contact numbers on there for refill. And if we're missing any, please let us know because um, but I'm sure estates and facilities know all the individual rooms more than I do. So um, as we know, women um, are setting a new standard for leadership and the next few slides talks about where we've come to, but there is still so much more to do. Uh, and it also talks about the, um, the impact of senior women leaders and what they can bring to an organisation. So again, on International Women's Day 2022, we commit to shining a light and celebrating the women who forge change, innovation and creative work. And we really need to embrace this. So going back to the empowerment that Duma talks about, that is so, so important. Um, I'm an executive of the trust here. That's not what I don't actually know how I got here, but it was through the support of others who empowered me. Who made me feel, feel that I was empowered to do something to do something different and to forge my way in that career and and um, empowered women should be empowering others and that's what this is this that's what this is about so I full, wholeheartedly support that so here's there's some data for those that like data that show here so um that show from entry level up to senior executive level what that looks like for uh, white men, men of colour, white women and women of colour and you can see from on here there is a difference and certainly as you increase through that hierarchy or through organisation um, we see an in, a, a disproportionate impact on those staff groups and that's something that we absolutely need to address because this is about inclusion. It isn't about exclusion, it's about inclusion because we recognise the benefits of that for for our um, organisation and the wider NHS. Which, so on this slide here, um, this shows the impact of um, where women lose the most ground and it's at the first step to manager level in the organisation. So on this day for International Women's Day 2022, we commit to action towards bridging the gender parity across all pay bands and bridging, bridging that gender pay gap. So allowing those opportunities for women to um, uh, get through those levels to um, forge that career to um, do what they can and want to do. We really want to embrace that. So next slide um, and what these next couple of slides do show actually that um, women senior managers, uh, managers in their roles, line managers etc do have do bring something different to the workplace and this is why inclusion is so so important. So it shows that um, in terms of well-being and workload that women, when people have been asked the question, do appear to help to take actions to prevent management burnout, do support, are very good at supporting their staff. It's Some of this may be general, but this, this, this is why the inclusion element is so important and that teamwork is so important. Next slide. And again, moving on from the same thing. So when employees have strong allies, and you can see from the data on here that they are more likely to recommend the company as a great place to work and are less likely to consider leaving. So um, that goes up to 86%. And when we go back again to consider that 80% of our workforce are women, we need to be supporting them in that. And we need to be um, addressing the issues that have been identified. So there have been some improvements, um, but there's still a long way to go on this, I think. And now I'm going to pass you to Kate Quinn, who's our Operational Director of HR. 
Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. And, um, happy International Women's Day, everybody. And nice to see so many of you were carving out time to attend. So I'm Kate Quinn. I'm the Operational Director of HR and OD, and I chair the East Lancs Hospitals Inclusion Network. Um, and I'm actively involved with um, a number of our staff networks as well, including the Women's Network. So as Michelle has just described, there is now a women's health strategy for England. And um, and again, I'm, I'm not sure what the seventh priority is. <laughs> it's missing from our slide. But um, I just want to talk you through um, a little in a little bit more detail what we're looking at doing as an organisation to support around, you know, meeting the needs um, for the these seven priority areas. Next slide, please, um, Eleanor. So, um, as we would want to with, with anything across DLHT, the first thing we need to do to improve um, conditions and to improve health and care systems uh, is to listen to women and to then think about how we reset our approach um, with women's voices at the centre. Um, and I think, you know, engagement is sort of something that we are passionate about here at ELHT and I think that's where we would start which is why Uma in her role as chair of the Women's Network will be leading a big a big women staff conversation. I don't know if that's for big women Uma or if we're including all women in that. <laughs> um, so that's uh, the outputs from that as we have done with our uh, BAME big conversation and our disability big conversations will form a report that will go through to the board because um, the board do take inclusion extremely seriously in terms of what we can do to improve staff experience. Um, just want to touch on pregnancy loss including miscarriage support for staff so we know that um, you know lots of uh, colleagues have um, miscarriage or fertility issues that, that cause them, you know, uh, distress and they would want us to provide support uh, to them during those difficult times. So on this IWD 2022, we do commit to strengthening uh, healthcare and workplace support for women and partners um, affected by pregnancy loss and other pregnancy and fertility related issues. Next slide, please. So in relation to, to this in particular, what we will do as an employer is make sure that we explore developing a policy to support staff that are experiencing miscarriage uh, as in line with the UK Miscarriage Association recommendations. Um, and I think just on the, the side of the slide here, it talks about the fact that one in four pregnancies is estimated to end in miscarriage um, and then there'll be other other um, ectopic and molar pregnancies that that um, people suffer with. So um, we know that lots of people experience multiple losses and we want to make sure that our policies and support is really geared up to support people, you know, during this these difficult times in their in their lives and working lives. Next slide. So menopausal health and again thinking about the, the number of um, women that we employ across ELHT and probably if we were to look at the age bracket that we fall into probably another 80% of that 80% um, are sort of in that um, peri or menopausal age group potentially um, and so it is our ambition to be an accredited menopause friendly workplace by 2025 and we're going to make a formal commitment to that today. Um, we have developed an in-house e-learning module on menopause and that's been launched today and all staff will be able to access that and we will be running a series of menopause cafes again being launched this month. Uh, we have had a menopause working group that was sort of um, set up through human resources and um, has supported work through the networks and um, and Lorraine will talk about this further. Um, I know from my own experience that menopause is a really difficult um, period of life um, and um, and that you know you can feel that you're going a little bit mad um, as you go through that and it, it is something that lasts for quite some time and you know symptoms vary at different points um, through your menopause so you know I would urge you to seek support around the menopause and um, I did do a little um, piece 
a few years ago around my own experience of menopause and I do know that a number of people reading it emailed me and said that they found it helpful so I would you know seek that out talk talk to one another at the menopause cafes and really help us shape the way we can help you um, at this period in your life. Um, moving on then so Uma talked uh, and L Michelle a little bit about you know um, the difference in um, gender parity across different roles and as you can see from this slide here um, because of the number of women that we employ actually we don't do too badly in terms of, of um, the band's one to seven roles we have quite a number of women in in those roles but as you can see that starts to break down as we reach the more senior manager uh, bands and so there's a real challenge for us in having a look at how we um, support uh, colleagues across the organisation through talent management to enable them to be able to break through into some of those more senior manager roles. Next slide please. So here we've got a slide that um, talks about um, pay bands by gender and ethnicity. Um, and you can see across the different staff groups there that there's there's quite a significant um, difference in numbers of staff across each of those areas. Um, we do know that nursing and midwifery um, have an overrepresentation, as you would expect, and there is an underrepresentation in medical and dental. And we've only two um, with two specialties where we've only one um, consultant. So that's trauma and orthopedics and colorectal surgery. Um, so what we're doing today is committing that gradually we will increase the consultant women's representation in specialities where they're significantly underrepresented um, and um, support staff from other professional groups in um, breaking through the, the glass ceiling. Next slide, please. Um, here we've got a slide that talks about the band pay banding across midwives um, and comparison between white and BAME midwives um, and it is really stark when you look at those numbers. So this is where we talk about some of the intersectionality. So not only um, are women um, disadvantaged is, is perhaps too strong a word, maybe it is the right word, I'm not sure, um, in terms of their banding. But then if they happen to be from a BME background as well, then they are they have another um, another set of bias that kind of prevents them from breaking through into the more senior roles. So um, what we will again commit to do is drive gender uh, an ethnic parity across all the pay bands above band six starting from today and this work will weave into our um, leadership and talent management strategy. And I think I am now going to hand over to Lorraine Hyam, our Workforce Innovation and Design Manager, who um, has been leading the work on menopause. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks very much for that intro, Kate, and um, happy International Women's Day to um, everyone on the call. Um, and I echo um, thanks to all of my other colleagues for their fabulous contributions so far. So as Kate said, my name's Lorraine. I am a member of the HR and OD team and a co-chair of our menopause working group. So I'm just going to share a few slides with you this morning that explain a little bit about the work of the group so far and our plans for the future. Um, I need to say at the, on, at the outset that this group is made up of a small but mighty group of colleagues, um, some of whom are on the call today. So um, this is not work that I've done on my own by any means. So big thanks to colleagues um, Lynn Wadiker, Jane Pemberton, Nina Hatfield, Joanne Davison, Kim Wood, Mags Wilson, Nicola Ebert, Sally Davis and John Houlihan, who have all been working really hard to kind of get this agenda um, up and running and on, on the radar. Um, so the first slide here just provides the context and, and relevance of this topic and the work of the menopause um, group. Despite the significant impact that the menopause and related symptoms can have on women and over a significant period of time, and despite the number of colleagues at ELHT, as Kate has said, female colleagues that this could affect, we're still not really talking about the menopause. 
Um, even our colleagues who are going through this often find it difficult to talk about. They find it difficult to talk about with friends, with family and especially at work. And this means that often they're not getting the support they need. Some may not even recognise their own symptoms and don't get any kind of treatment or support, which in turn can have a massive impact both on their home and work life. Um, it was refreshing to hear last year that, the par that there was a parliamentary inquiry by the Women and Equalities Commission and they've recently published their workplace, their first workplace survey results that confirmed that women don't tell people at work that they're going through the menopause, despite the vast majority finding that the symptoms impact them at work. The report also highlighted that the support needed by employees ranged hugely from very practical measures such as greater flexibility around work shifts to cultural changes about removing stigma, encouraging openness, education um, and raising awareness um, and, and that's very much um, what we are here to do. Um, sorry, my cat's just sat on my keyboard. Um, this committee will report to Parliament later on in the spring um, about their, their findings as a, whole, as a whole. They are still taking evidence, but it is expected that they'll make some recommendations generally about workplace practices and, and some potential changes in legislation to support the menopause at work. Um, so it's actually nice to see that at, at ELHT we were ahead of the national curve in acknowledging that our colleagues who are going through the menopause need acknowledgement, understanding and often may need our support. So as Kate explained, a small group formed back in 2019 to look at how we could raise awareness and support for menopause in the workplace and as a start, a starting point, just get people talking about the menopause. Um, you may remember with support from our well team, we organised our first series of menopause cafes back in 2019 um, and they were very well attended and very well received. Um, we then had 12 months that were very much dominated by COVID, but we were finally able to come back together um, as a group and to this agenda last year and were supported by our exec team in our pledge to become a menopause friendly employer. Um, we need to say at the start of this that it's not a quick fix. It's not something that we just want to kind of attach to our um, email footers and our recruitment. It's something that we really believe in um, and, and we need to see embedded across the organisation, which makes it not easy to achieve. However, what it has done is provide us with a roadmap and a plan to help us understand what we need to do to um, improve understanding of the menopause at work and how we can support and improve the experience of our colleagues going through this. Ultimately, um, it, it's an it's a it's a no brainer really. This can only have a positive impact on workforce wellbeing and possibly even our workforce retention. Um, next slide, please. So before we can even consider applying for full accreditation, we've still got a lot to work of work to do around all sorts of areas. So around our culture, around our policies and our practice, training and in some places the facilities that we provide for um, our female colleagues. Despite us being a small but perfectly formed group, we have made significant pro progress over the last nine months, um, starting with developing and publishing our ELHT menopause guidance document and followed this up by developing and publishing a whole library of fact sheets, guides and resources to support colleagues and managers and to generally start to raise awareness around the menopause. Um, so these talk about menopause in the workplace, but also about wider menopause symptoms, treatments and how to start having conversations, not only with your manager, with colleagues, but also potentially with medical professionals, which is something that we know a lot of our colleagues don't do. We have received really positive feedback about these resources and will continue to develop and add to these over the coming months. We've also tried to tried to raise general awareness around the menopause and this suite of resources through um, the wellbeing newsletter and the wellbeing directory and through general comms um, and our HR team have been really supportive around trying to get this message out through our divisions and divisional managers as well. And all of this work lays the foundations for improving the experience of colleagues going through the menopause and is all stuff that we will need to evidence when we finally apply to be accredited. So what next? 
well, another important element of the journey to be recognised as a menopause friendly employer is to encourage a culture where this is talked about openly and to have in place both formal mechanisms and support for colleagues, but equally important. And I think as Kate has already mentioned, for us to develop, develop informal networks and engage um, with, with our colleagues. This is vitally making sure that the work that we do as a group um, is relevant and we really understand the issues facing our colleagues. So with the support of Mary Aku, our gynae and sexual health advisor, the Wells team have launched a new series of menopause cafes and information sessions. So these will run monthly on teams for the next few months um, and provide an informal, safe and supportive environment for those wanting to know a little bit more about the menopause and share their experiences with colleagues in a similar position. I will pop, there is now a link, um, a website that you can go to to book um, yourself onto these sessions and once I finish presenting I'll pop that link in the chat for anybody that's interested or anybody that wants to share that with colleagues. Um, last slide please. So as, as Kate's kind of already preempted for me, last but not least, we are really pleased to announce that our first e-learning module around the menopause will be launched and available later on today on the Learning Hub. So this has been developed to bring together the key elements of the menopause guidance into a short, sharp 15, 20 minute learning session. Um, it's been designed to help colleagues and managers learn more about the menopause, about symptoms, effects, and more imp most importantly, how we can support and manage this in the workplace. Um, it sets into context some of the issues faced by our colleagues who are going through the menopause and has some really useful case studies in there um, developed from discussions with HR colleagues, our staff side colleagues and some divisional management colleagues and show some examples of where we've got this very right and others unfortunately show that we've still got some learning to do and improving around the way we um, support menopause or tackle menopause in the workplace. All these case studies, however, however, followed by a series of learning points to help us improve our approach in the future. So obviously I'd encourage everybody, um, colleagues, managers, male or female, to have a look at the training. Um, even if the menopause is something that's not particularly on your radar now, there's every chance that it will be at some point in the future. This may be directly or by supporting a colleague or a member of staff or because a member of your family or friends is going through it. Um, and remember, we do still need to talk a lot more about the menopause. Um, so that's me. Um, I'll now pass over to Jennifer. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, Eleanor, if you could just go to the start of the slides again for me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the wonderful women that have just presented uh, prior to myself. My name's Jenny Howarth and I am the baby friendly specialist midwife here at ELHT. Um, I am presenting on behalf of Sue Henry, who is the baby friendly lead here at ELHT. Um, she couldn't be with us today, um, so therefore that's why I'm presenting instead. Um, so. Sue herself, um, she has worked within ELHT for 36 years, primarily as a nurse on um, a medical ward, and she's also been a midwife for 28 years. She began her current specialist role as the baby friendly specialist lead 18 years ago, and she's also been a lactation consultant for 10 years. Um, she's Absolutely. She has actually joined the call now. Um, I've just seen her face pop up on my screen. Um, she is delighted and absolutely honoured to actually have received the ELHT Outstanding Achievement Award in 2018, the Chief Midwifery Officer's Gold Medal in 2019, and also recently in 2021, she has received the British Empire Medal in the Queen's New Year's Honours List. So I'm sure you would agree what a fantastic woman she is. So the UNICEF Baby Friendly Gold Standards. So it's an absolute pleasure to work on the baby friendly team alongside Sue. Um, and it's also a pleasure to lead in the UNICEF baby friendly gold standard in our maternity services. And it's a great joy to say that we were actually the first service to ever receive this award in the world. 
It was a privilege to work with such inspiring and expert teams of people who all contribute to the standards required every single day to maintain this standard. And credit must go to the full service, our multidisciplinary team approach and the great collaboration with partners. This has absolutely massively helped to optimise the care that we provide, the experiences that women receive as part of ELHT and outcome for the families. The gold standard demonstrates long-term sustainability in baby-friendly care, which involves an evidence-based approach to infant feeding and relationship building between parents and their babies. Our service has demonstrated great leadership, a fantastic culture of education and kindness, robust monitoring processes and continuous pro pro progression and improvements. And you can see here on this slide, this is what it's demonstrating, the four key principles of the gold standards here at ELHT. And we need to continue to progress the service in order to maintain these baby friendly standards and our gold accreditation. Next slide, please, Eleanor. Our service, one of our service improvements was to develop a team of breastfeeding champions across the trust because we know that breastfeeding helps to protect women's health and well-being, including reducing the risk of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, endometri endometrial cancer, depression, diabetes, hypertension, rheumatoid arthritis and improving bone and cardiovascular health. So it is really important. So one of our uh, our breastfeeding champions understand these health gains to women and are passionate to support colleagues across the trust who wish to return to work and continue to breastfeed their babies or express their breast milk. We know the transition back to work can be a very worrying time and quite an anxious time for these women. So the champions here at ELHT can help with practical suggestions, have knowledge around our policy to support staff, and be willing to support as long as needed. So this wonderful um, logo was actually designed by one of our ELHT breastfeeding champions, Holly Henderson. So thank you so much, Holly, for this. And if you are, or if you are interested in becoming a breastfeeding champion, um, this logo is something that you can add onto your emails at the bottom because it's something to be very much proud of here at ELHT. Next slide, please. So the ELHT breast, uh, volunteer breastfeeding champions role. So the champions role, it's important to note that the champions do this voluntarily. Um, they are ready to have supportive, motivating, encouraging conversations with an aim to protect and support the staff members breastfeeding journey, milk supply and their individual choices. So you can see here that that's what it encompasses. It's about those supportive conversations, able to support them when needed in their transition period when returning to work, helping to motivate, encourage, empower, support and protect breastfeeding and the willing and eager to help ELHT to improve breastfeeding support. And they do have access to the current evidence based information and can refer directly to ourselves on the baby friendly team. Next slide, please. So these are the wonderful individuals that we call our ELHT breastfeeding champions. As you can see, they're from across all areas of ELHT, not just nursing and midwifery. These may be people that are particularly passionate about breastfeeding, or it might be that they have breastfed themselves um, and they've gone through this transition, maybe back to work themselves, but they are in all the different areas ready to support women to return to work or just in general with their breastfeeding journeys whilst they are at work. So a massive, massive thank you to all 24 champions from all the different areas of our trust. Today on this International Women's Day, we want to thank you all. We are super, super proud of you all. Next slide, please. So this is just one staff member's experience. So I'm going to read this out to you. So returning to work while breastfeeding has been a smooth and manageable experience for me. Before I went off on maternity leave, one of the breastfeeding champions in my area signposted me to read the policy on returning to work and breastfeeding. So I knew before my baby was born, I will be welcomed back as a breastfeeding parent and was never concerned. 
She also advised having a conversation with my manager before returning to discuss expressing and storing my milk whilst at work, which I felt fully support, which I did and felt fully supported and prepared. I have been encouraged to take additional breaks when needing to express both for my own health and for the health of my baby. I have been fully supported in every sense and having contact with a breastfeeding champion has made this transition back to work much less daunting for me. Well, that's just absolutely fantastic. So thank you to all our 24 breastfeeding champions. And if you yourself listening today, for the attendees, for anyone at all that you may think might be interested in becoming an ELHT breastfeeding champion, then please do get in touch with Sue Henry or myself, Jennifer Howarth, or you can even email our team inbox on the baby friendly team at elht.nhs.uk. So thank you so much for allowing us to present here today. It's an absolute privilege and pleasure and happy International Women's Day to you all. Thank you very much. Over to Louise. Good morning. Um, I'd just like to echo the thanks. Thank you for that, Jenny, and thank you to all my fellow colleagues today that are presenting and also a very happy International Women's Day to everybody who is on the webinar today. So I would just like to um, showcase our services within ELHT that we provide within maternity. We could have the next slide, please, Helena. OK, so just um, a little outline of what our maternity services here within ELHT. Um, we've got quite a significant proportion of midwives working within our team. And whilst we are uh, celebrating International Women's Day, I would like to say that we do have a male midwife, um, Andrew Lumsden, who is very much part of our team. He's been very crucial recently in driving forward our digital end-to-end uh, -end system as we have implemented Badgenet. We support approximately six and a half thousand births across East, East Lancashire. So that's quite a significant number of women, babies, families coming through our services. And within our team, which um, is very much multidisciplinary, um, we have great collaboration with all the professionals that work alongside us to provide antenatal, intrapartum and postnatal care. We offer the service within two models. We have a consultant model. We have a fantastic relationship with all our consultant obstetricians and gynaecologists, neonates, and we also provide a midwif uh, midwifery led care service as well. So here on the Burnley site, we have our Lancashire Women and Newborn Centre, which um, opened uh, around about 10, 11 years ago now when we merged across the two sites. And we have uh, services that are focused on gynaecology. We have an antenatal outpatient service. We have a fetal medicine, which is phenomenal that we're providing that for the women within our care. Um, several years ago, quite a number of these women were needing to go to the tertiary centres, so Liverpool and Manchester. So to have that service locally to support those women it is, is fantastic. We also have an antenatal ward and a triage. Um, we have our central birth suite, which has 18 birth rooms. Two of those are close observation beds, particularly because we have uh, our acute services with regards to our uh, critical care and ICU across over on the Blackburn site. So that enables us to focus uh, care on some of those more um, high level mums and babies on our site, in our central birth suite, who need that intensive care and we can keep mums and babies together. So that prevents separation. And we also have two bereavement suites, which supports our mums who may sadly suffer uh, pregnancy loss and loss of the babies. We have an alongside midwife birth centre on site, which uh, has seven birth rooms. We have a postnatal ward with 38 beds and 38 cots um, and we provide transitional care as well. So again, that's focused on keeping our mums and babies together, preventing separation for those babies um, that maybe just need a little bit more care, but not necessarily the neonatal level. And we have our neonatal unit with uh, level three 34 cots 
uh, all together providing ICU and special care. So we have a phenomenal service here at HLHT, which we're really, really proud to showcase. And also over at Blackburn side, we have antenatal outpatients. We have a freestanding Blackburn birth centre, um, which is uh, phenomenal there. We have our midwives working uh, on the Partley Road site and they have four birth rooms. We have Rossendale antenatal outpatient and midwife led birth centre there. And we also have numerous specialist services within our trust. So I'm sure you'll agree that we, we are there providing fantastic services for the women and the families uh, within our area. So in order to support our local women, we know that across the trust we have a very diverse population um, with regards to age, ethnicity, culture, a race, disability, religion, and within our service, we are supporting women and their families because we provide our care as a holistic, so it's family focused. So we must remember the partners um, and the families, the wider families as well. We have many women that have complex issues, they're suffering from domestic violence, women that maybe have mental health, um, and you know, particularly that's that's particularly at the forefront of things with the last two years that we've just all endured with the pandemic. Um, and supporting our mums as well with substance misuse um, and trying to achieve equity for, for all these mums, even though they've got these complexities, how can we support them to have that care at this very vulnerable time in their lives where they're bringing a new life into the world? We have a lot of women with diabetes, women with learning disability. Um, I've mentioned about our fetal medicine unit, so we also look after families with a lot of complex pregnancies and we have safeguarding issues as well. Next slide, please, Eleanor, thank you. So one of our focuses within maternity and also within our local maternity systems is around equality and diversity. Just um, to give you a, a quick Quick snapshot, 34% of women who gave birth here between April 2019 and March 2020 were actually from a minority ethnic background and the majority of those being from a Pakistani background. So that's quite a, you know, a significant number that are accessing our services that need that, to, um, that support from us. Next slide, please. Eleanor, thank you. So just looking at some of these contributory factors that are there that we are supporting families with the communication, language barriers, how can we ensure that these families and these mums have got that same opportunity to have that informed decision making experience when they come through our services and that we're ensuring that they can make the decisions about the pregnancy, have the information um, to be able to ensure they have a smooth, post, a smooth pathway through our services. Financial factors, you know, we have a lot of social uh, deprivation across, you know, our geographical area. So income, um, these groups can be hit harder than, than other groups. And again, it's how can we support them um, to be able to get to appointments and access the care. We know that there is a poor access to care with some of our groups um, and it's how do we adapt our services um, to be able to support those groups and other services that can come on board to help us when we're looking at um, you know, housing and family factors for these groups. One of the things that we've done particularly with the COVID is we had a COVID, we were fortunate enough to be able to develop a COVID vaccination hub um, at the foyer to our Lancashire Women and Newborn Centre and there's also just been two band three uh, staff members, um, one of them from our own trust here who's been appointed into a specialist COVID vaccination in pregnancy role to target um, those mums and those families who we know are, uh, are finding it a little bit more challenging maybe to, um, to access some of these services. And we also know that comorbidities impact on maternal well-being, morbidity, mortality, when we're looking at you know, high prevalence of diabetes, asthma, obesity, all those clinical factors 
that we need to be supporting mums with. This is a poster just to show some of the work that we do within our services collaboratively. Um, it's very uh, you know, poignant. We work with our service users um, they are pivotal in, in helping us drive our services within maternity and we're really proud to showcase that within uh, ELHT. We have good working relationships with our Maternity Voices Partnership, so there's representation on there, um, again from our service users. We have our local maternity systems, so we're working alongside the other trusts within our footprint. So Blackpool, Morecambe Bay, Preston. What can we learn? What can we share with each other to make the experiences for, for our families um, as improved as we can? And this poster came from some of the work that we did around our BAME population and how could we get posters out there how could we support the midwives to be able to deliver information to families in the various languages, um, which you know is, is, is pivotal. And we also have, I know Shazia Aslam, one of our midwives is, is on the webinar with us today. Um, and we've other midwives within our service, Sundas Khalid um, and Phoebe Sadhu, that'd be quite pivotal in working alongside myself with the Achieving Equity Group within the Trust to ensure that we um, are developing services and working locally and um, they've done some work with the local radio to get some targeted health messages out and um, for these women there's work going on as well within the mental health services and we also have genetics on site uh, from nascan from saint mary's is based within our antenatal outpatients now to support some of our mums and families that have complex pregnancies I've attached the link there just for um, information where some of this work for the BAME communities is uh, available. And it's about building our relationships as well with those local services, Derry and House, Home Start, and ASAM is the um, Association of South Asian Midwives, which one of our midwives, Sundas Khalid, is co-founder and director for. Um, and particularly, they provide a, a platform um, for South Asian midwifery workforce and, and birthing community, which is uh, you know, very exciting and um, there to support the women. Could we have the next slide, please? Eleanor, thank you. So again, some of the key messages when we look at the national reports from the Embrace, so important to support our women preventing maternal deaths. And um, just looking at the significant decrease, uh, there's been no statistical significant decrease in the overall maternal death rate in the UK, but there are recognised substantial inequalities when we're looking at um, women from deprived areas women from black asian and mixed ethnicity and you know these are the cohorts of, of mothers and families that that we are providing care for and there's actions in place to start to address these inequalities next slide slide please eleanor cardiac disease there's a leading cause for women um six weeks after the end of pregnancy we've got rising mortality rates for the women from the less deprived areas. The maternal mortality rate from SUDEP, this is a concern, and this is around sudden expected death and epilepsy. Suicide, again, still remains leading cause, and suicides amongst teenagers. So there's lots of work, and it's how we develop our services, listen to our service users, take note of these key reports to um, develop our services to move forward that we're supporting in women and families that are accessing our services. Next slide, please, Alana. So just to showcase further what we have and how um, you know we're doing some of this work, we have a, a vast array of specialist services within maternity. Um, and I've uh, just named here some of our specialist midwives and our consultants working collaboratively, collaboratively to support this various group um, of women that, that have these needs. So a specialist perinatal mental health service led by Claire Yates and uh, Natalie Woodruff alongside Manisha Golash. That's a phenomenal service and growing all the time. 
we have perinatal specialist teams um, who are able to come and support families. You know, it's so important that, you know, we're providing the care, getting the right medication for these mums when they're going home to the families with the babies. Liz Madron and Louise Slater, specialist midwives that support our families uh, with substance misuse. We have a children's safeguarding midwife, Kath Thomas. We have a specialist antenatal and newborn screening midwife, Jo Hilton. Our diabetes team, Sarah Carter. Our Maple team and midwives, uh, alongside our consultants, Fiona Hayne, Sarah Davis and Sarah Loveridge. And that is a hugely growing service. So constantly developing all the time, which um, is, is phenomenal in, in kind of reducing the uh, the morbidity for, for these families. Kath Sandsby leads on our bereavement services alongside the wider bereavement services within the trust and also alongside our neonatal colleagues. Um, and as we've seen a wonderful presentation from Sue and Jenny, who lead our specialist infant feeding team alongside Donna Butler, Misha, Katie and Nairi. Next slide please, Alida. So just a couple of pictures here. I know um, Shazia is on the call and Phoebe and Sundas. Um, and I just particularly wanted to, to mention them because I know that they're doing a lot of work around the achieving equity with the uh, the, the BAME mums uh, in, our, uh, in, in our services. So next slide, please, Eleanor. And here's just a few more of our strong mums within maternity um, supporting uh, strong mums that we provide the service for. The, the picture there on the top left, uh, that's back in 2014 um, when we were there, you know, trying to fight for, for our, uh, our rights for pay. We've got a picture there of our midwifery support worker, Keely Barrett in 2019, and we're really proud of Keely. She is our, the first maternity support worker um, to be elected onto the Royal College of Midwives National Board. So that's absolutely phenomenal. Ke Keely works on our postnatal uh, ward and she's um, she does lots of work. And some of you may remember back at the uh, end of last year in 2021, um, there was a national March for midwives around improving our maternity services for families and for women and and that's some of our midwives there that are supporting that in in driving our services forward so that's that's just us in our maternity services we're really proud of what we provide here at uh, a dlht and um, we've got lots of really uh, passionate midwives and staff amongst us and our male colleagues, our MDT, um, which is absolutely phenomenal. And we're extremely committed to both supporting our service users, but also for each other as well. Thank you. And I'm gonna hand over to Elizabeth and Samina. First rookie error, my microphone was on mute. However, I'll start again. Um, good morning, everybody, and um, happy International Women's Day to you all. Um, I'd just like to thank Louise for a fantastic presentation and all the other women that have presented this morning. It's extremely empowering itself listening to you all. Um, my name's Liz Reed. I'm the Breast Imaging Manager, and part of that role is to be the program manager for East Lancashire Breast Screening Service. And for those of you that don't know about uh, the Breast Screening Service, Breast Screening is a national program which is hosted here at ELHT. Um, within East Lanx, our population of eligible women is 75,000. Uh, women are invited every three years for a screening or more commonly known a mammogram um, between the ages of 50 and 71. Um, and I've been asked today to just highlight um, an all women's event that we are hosting um, 
at the Ginner Centre in Burnley. Um, uptake for breast screening varies considerably across East Lancashire and um, it's very commonly known that there are a lot of barriers for women uh, presenting at breast screening and taking up their free three yearly mammogram. Um, and we're always looking for ways to raise awareness of uh, breast screening, cancer screening programmes, um, providing women with information. Um, one of the ways we came up with um, actually an idea um, from uh, Sanam Taj, who I have to say thank you to. Sanam is our patient navigator and health promotion officer within breast screening. And um, the breast screening program works by inviting different cohorts of patients from GP practices. And we were due to start screening in Burnley. Um, Burnley uh, has not the best uptake of breast screening and we wanted to try and encourage women to come to breast screening and one of the reasons that was one of the reasons for doing this breast health event um, so i'd like to pass over to samina to give a little bit more of an update of exactly what the health event involves Hi, if I may, I just want to introduce myself and just give you a bit of a background um, details about myself. So I started here in East Langs about 29 years ago uh, as a HCA in maternity. I worked in antenatal clinic, Edith Watson Women's Health Unit, if you can remember. Um, I was a healthcare assistant on antenatal ward, postnatal. I used to work on the birth suite. I used to run in theatre. I did that for eight years and then I went on to do my nurse training. Um, when I qualified my nurse training, I, I got a job on the gynae and breast care ward. But it was the Watson ward then, it was only gynae. Um, so overall, um, I am now, it's been three years, I am now a practice educator and lead cancer staff nurse. Um, in, uh, on the Ghanaian Breast Care Ward. Um, I'm also a BAME champion and I'm also a Freedom to Speak Up champion. Uh, back background, I'm Pakistani. I speak Pashto and Urdu. I'm very passionate um, about a lot of things and you tend to see me in a lot of meetings, um, especially when it comes to um, BAME uh, issues. So I was in my element when Sanam invited me to the women's health event and I'm very excited and passionate about it. So this event is on Sunday, 13th of March. Um, excuse me. So on Sunday we will be having several different stalls. Um, one will represent the breast, breast cancer screening service. There is going to be some researchers coming from UCLan and we'll be giving out questionnaires just to see what barriers there is to breast screening, um, why women will not uptake it, what are the taboos um, and what, what's the stigma that people find that they find difficult to actually go and attend breast screening. We're also going to have some stalls for um, the gynae CNSs. We're going to promote um, the gynecological cancers, the signs and symptoms um, and support any women that have any problems. We're going to discuss menopause, menopausal bleeding. Uh, we're going to discuss cervical cancers. Again, we're going to explore issues and talk to ladies. What are the barriers? Why do they hesitate if they do hesitate on uptaking any cervical screening? So myself, um, Karen Livesey, Bryony Bass, all the gynae CNSs will be present there. There'll also be the McMinnell Information Services. Anyone that's gone through cancer that are worried about financial issues of cancer and other related problems, 
Macmillan services will be there to support and hand out information. There will be a stall about Care is a Link. There will be a Harry bus. So on this bus, there'll be some professionals that will be doing blood pressure checks, blood pressure checks for these ladies. Minds Matters will be attending. And also we have invited um, two small businesses from the community. One will be selling savoury dishes and another one will be selling sweet dishes. They'll be doing some baking. Uh, we have given these stalls free of charge. They'll be making their own profit and it will help these women to advertise their businesses and help them as well. So I'm so, so excited because I live in Stonium um, and Dane's House area. And the, this area was one of the areas that has been targeted. I know all the GP surgeries. Um, I know these women, they all know me. They know me from my maternity days. They know me from the gynae ward. They know me in the community. Whenever there's an event, I'm always there. I volunteer. So whether there's a death bereavement, uh, whether there's a wedding, this venue is always used. So I'd like to think that women will approach me um if they have any concerns they need any support so yeah um i'm in my element i'm so excited about this event and we have advertised it throughout the community i've used social platform i've used whatsapp to invite these ladies um we've announced it at the mosques as well to encourage these ladies to attend and yeah so looking forward to it and hopefully this will be one of many um, future events. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Samina. So to new beginnings, as we said right at the beginning, this is the first International Women's Day for us. Our women's network is quite young, so we have to embed it and then we have to build on it. In reaching or outreaching into the communities and collaborating with our community partners is something which is which was actively discussed and is part of the group remit. So definitely we will be reaching out to you with regards to any future initiatives that we can tap into. One of the things we have done is we have made contact with the local women's institute. So the Burnley Women's Institute, the president is actually one of our retired midwives, uh, Margaret. So we've made contact with her and she's very keen for us to visit the women's institute and make sure that we take some of the work we do on enhance awareness raising to them and the community women there. So we have a conduit and a platform to reach our women in the community through that. And there is another group called the Gopal Girls in the Gopal village. Again, it is led by one of our retired midwives, Lindsay, who many of you would know. So again, we've made contact. Um, in principle, we have agreed that in the summer that we will be visiting one of their meetings to make sure that we take some of the key messages that will benefit women to them. And some of the messages uh, from today's themes. Uh, and then uh, Kate Quinn, uh, she does everything, like I said, right at the beginning. She has uh, rejuvenated and reinvigorated the Women's Institute in Goosner, which has not been functional for quite some time, extending the focus on women's initiatives and women's causes into the community. And uh, already booked me in for a talk in the session on menopause and women's health in the summer, latter part of the summer. So there are three groups and Sundas College, who does the Association of South Asian Midwives, is very keen for us to do partnership work with her organization, which run national conferences and also has a lot of contact with the midwives, there, with the community midwives and the other groups. So we can learn from each other and there is always shared learning and shared resources that women will benefit from. So just wanted to highlight that. So we've come full round. What a range of amazing sessions. Really would like to openly applaud and appreciate all the wonderful work that is going behind these talks that were delivered today and for sharing it with our delegates who will be equally inspired by what fantastic work is going on at East Langs and how our women are driving these initiatives and have to thank our male colleagues who are our allies and whatever we do, it benefits everybody and that message has to come through and through. So this slide, which you can see on the screen, 
is in 1974 when women were demonstrating for bread and peas in Petrograd, Russia. So not 1974, even before. The 1911 was the very first one. So this is 1918 <clears throat> or 1916. Now, I couldn't but help the thought, if only the women in Russia were protesting like this in these times, probably we could have saved a world war, uh, uh, not a world war, the current war that is going on with the detrimental impact on women and children and families and our men folk. Everybody is disrupted with distress. So just for that reason. Next slide, please, uh, Eleanor. So we were, this is the 1974 British poster. The reason I included this was, if you look closely, you can look at the themes in their agenda, how many decades ago? Four decades ago, four and a half decades ago. So that, but we still have two of the items on our agenda now. Equal pay now is still there because that uh, gender uh, pay gap is still a real issue world, worldwide and NHS and uh, UK are not exempt from it. And there is also the other, which is regarding job opportunities. Ed education has been addressed reasonably with all the resources by the government, but the job opportunities is still a problem because of the nature of flexible working that women may want that is family friendly. And while there has been a significant improvement, it is still not off the table. So just wanted to highlight that. Uh, and so we have work to do, guys, four and a half decades to address the other issues. So we have to continue working relentlessly. This is the we know the color of the Ukrainian flag, and this is the mimosa plant, which brings beautiful blooms in the summer months. It extends all the way through. I've ordered one. That is a symbol of International Women's Day in Ukraine and Italy too. So as the first sign of planting a tree initiative, if anybody wants to do that, this year might be a good year because it will remind us of what happened this year in the world arena and it will bring us so much joy in our gardens. So the next slide. Before we conclude, so once again, I would like to all our ladies who are watching the, from anywhere or watching the recorded session later. You're all amazing. Wonderful work is being carried out and the worldwide literature tells us that often the leadership by women and the work they do, especially the work that women do in equality, diversity, equity, diversity and inclusion agenda goes unnoticed and unrecognized. We got to change that, guys. Let us applaud each other, appreciate each other and get that ripple of appreciation going far, not just for women, for everybody, because a little appreciation goes a long way, as we know, with regards to performance enhancement, morale, well-being, health, etc. Again, let us spread the positive ripple. I want to thank Holly Anderson, who stepped up because we didn't have any admin support for our last few meetings and we did the a women's conversation engagement event it is waiting to be typed up and uh, submitted to board as a report, which we'll be doing. But Holly Henderson has been instrumental in making sure that the administrative side of the women's network was kept smooth. So thank you, Holly, wherever you are listening to it. It's very much appreciated. You're one of those who made today possible. And I would like to thank Nasid Magda for the EDI efforts at the trust wide level and Mudasid Gray, who provides all the statistics. Anytime you request, he gets it very quickly with the turnaround. So thank you for that. And Eleanor, Shelley and Sally from the communications team. They have been real champions of the inclusive agenda. So you will know the work they did around the inclusion wall. It was not easy. It might seem like just one wall adorned with, adorned with all the statements, but there was a lot of hard work that went behind the scenes. And likewise, they are now looking at ways in which they can visibly show the trust commitment to inclusion and the zero tolerance to discrimination of any kind so that we reduce those four areas of NHS staff survey outcome in the long run, which is discriminating the behavior from the patients and public or the relatives and also from colleagues, managers and others. So uh, thank you to the communications team. And uh, I forgot to mention this earlier. 
So I saw, I read the BMG, BMA article on the period poverty, looked up and looked at the other related articles as to how Scotland ended it, et cetera, and saw an example of another trust who have done it, tweeted it, and then happened to meet Michelle in one of the IG steering group meeting. And while we were talking, she said, Emma, by the way, that tweet, I took a screenshot and I've saved it. And I said, Michelle, can we do something about it? Can we not bring it to East Langs? And she said, leave it with me. Let me see what I can do. Unbelievable. You should see the trail of emails she had to uh, procurement, estates. You, you may think it is just sanitary pads, but there was so much, so many steps involved before we could procure even sanitary pads for staff to all the toilets in the right. NHS setting. Hats off to Michelle. She's a lady of action, fewer words, but her actions say everything. And that is a great role modeling for us, uh, Michelle. And again, her inclusive focus is very sharp. In a meeting when we are presenting papers, if there are stark differences or inequitable figures, she will be the first one to comment and say, that is stark, we need to do something about it. So great to have you on board, Michelle. Again, another fantastic role model for all of us alongside Kate in this inclusion agenda. And each one of you in the audience, both men and women, and all the ladies here. Well done, guys. Absolutely fantastic work. And uh, empowered wo woman, whether in the home front, work front, school front, as a mother, grandmother, all the different roles we have and at the work front is powerful beyond measure. And that inner beauty will shine through beyond description. And anything that we nurture, we can grow really well. I love gardening and I use that analogy all the time. You know, what we consider weeds may be medicinal herbs with great properties, but we may not know about it now. A lot of the cancer cure medications, including the Vinca alkaloids, they were considered as weeds for a very long time. I come from the coastal city of Kerala, the town of the state of Kerala. Vink alkaloids, there is a huge belt, but they are now life saving medications. We thought they were really proper weeds. So, likewise, whenever you have a negative feeling towards otherness in, in any other human being, pause and think they may hold magical cure for us, just innovation waiting to be discovered. Just put that inclusive lens, use the inclusion index scale and enable that inclusive um, culture to grow in East Langs. Little, it's a tiny action, but with mammoth impact as is well evidence based. So on that note, I can't see any questions here. Do any of our panel members have a question? And by the way, I put my hands up. It is a typo error, Kate and Michelle. There are, there are only six key priorities in the national strategy. It was me typing up, I put it as seven. So I went and checked the document. There are only six key priorities and um, we can amend that before we publish it. So thank you so much, everybody. Once again, happy International Women's Day, folks. Celebrate it. Plant a tree, plant, plant a small tree even. This is the first International Women's Day to mark that and wish everyone the very best in your journeys. And let us hope there is work to do. We will make sure that work is picked up uh, through our networks. No network will work uh, singularly and alone. The intersectionality will make sure all the networks work together. Thank you. Kate, Michelle, would you like to say anything before we conclude? Um, just for me, uh, Uma, there are a number of questions that we've received today. I think nearly all of them have been answered, so we will pick this up through the communications team as well to make sure those messages get out. I think there are 27, so quite a lot, which is really, so the interest has been really, really great. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody else for, for taking part today and to you, Uma, for your leadership in this. As I said earlier, it's been outstanding. So, um, and a great platform for us to celebrate International Women's Day. So thank you. And I'm sure Kate wants to add to that. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Uma, for your leadership on this um, and, and thank you to everybody for attending. It's really great um, to see folks taking time uh, for such an important agenda. Um, we've, as Uma says, lots of work to do, but we're committed to doing it. And um, I've popped in the chat that, you know, you need to be kind to yourselves because you don't have to be perfect. We are good enough. Um, and, you know, I think the other message I would give is that, you know, we're here to support each other and as women helping women that's what we should be doing so um, I look forward to meeting more of you on the corridors um, over the next few weeks and months but thank you. Absolutely brilliant I couldn't see the questions and I realised that now but we'll pick it up as Michelle said later so on that note we will conclude this live webinar on that positive note Yes, we can together and we'll break the bias, ladies and gentlemen out there. Break the bias, everybody. Thank you, Eleanor.